for the Finance and Audit Committee meeting will be called to order and I will look for a motion to adopt the agenda. Move it. Second. All those in favor? <coughs> Aye. And yeah. Tony and Steve, I believe, are giving us a safety briefing today. Thank you, Chair Lynn Han and, and committee members. Before we have our safety moment, let's take a minute to recall that in the event of an emergency, uh, let's make sure to call 911 and alert others. Uh, if the emergency is such that it requires an evacuation, uh, let's all remember to use the stairwell and not the elevator. And for those of you in the T-19 meeting area, uh, please recall that the designated assembly location will be the Baptist parking garage which is located at the corner of Ashley and Main Street. Uh, please remember to make sure to pair up with your safety partner, which will be the person to your right, and always be cognizant of the potential for trip hazards and the need to wear your mask in those situations where we cannot socially distance. And lastly, uh, members, please remember to keep your cell phones on silent and on mute when not actively speaking during today's committee meeting. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Steve Tootin, who is our Director of Audit Services for today's Safety Moment. Steve. There we go, sorry. Yeah, good morning, everybody. The uh, safety hierarchy of controls you see on the slide here is actually a workplace safety guide that was developed by the National Institute of o Occupational Safety and, and Health, NIOSH. And it's a five-step process that helps safety professionals reduce the risk of harm to workers. And it, when applied, it can actually provide a robust safety methodology applicable to any workplace environment. Uh, I found a good example online that I think everybody can understand uh, as far as a task. Uh, opening a box, whether it's one you get at the house or at the office or on your loading dock. Um, I'm gonna kind of walk through these five steps um, and you would say, okay, yeah, that's a simple process, opening a box. But I can tell you early in my career, there was a coworker who managed to create three recordables in the span of about 30 seconds and it all began with carelessly opening a box. Uh, elimination, the first one is trying to actually uh, take the uh, hazard completely out of the, the environment. Uh, in the case of box opening, you'd say, uh, can you open it by hand or do you need to use a blade? Uh, then substitution would be uh, trying to find the best means to, uh, to do that opening. And you would say there, uh, okay, instead of using a serrated fishing knife, can I use a case cutter that's probably safer? Uh, engineering controls, this is kind of more along the lines of uh, maybe instead of the, the human element of opening the box, if you have a, a large quantity of boxes or maybe a very well sealed box, can a machine maybe substitute for a human doing the, doing the cutting? And uh, administrative controls, the fourth tier, is uh, actually tries to shift the focus from the hazard to the human element. For example, can the worker employ a more safe cutting method? And then finally, one that we're all familiar with here, JDA PPE, uh, ideally a worker should use uh, cut resistant gloves to do that cutting. So that's basically the, the safety hierarchy of controls. Uh, if no one has any questions, uh, back to you, Tony. Okay, thanks so much, Steve. Such, such an important topic there. And Chair Lanahan, before turning it back over to you, real quickly, an update on our primary lagging performance indicator for fiscal year 21 year to date. It continues to trend very, very favorably into the second quarter, and we expect that to continue throughout the fiscal year. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. And Steve, I'll never open a box the same way again without thinking about you. Um, appreciate the safety briefing. We'll um, ask for a motion to approve the minutes to the prior meeting. Move it. Second. All the uh, 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 fabulous motion carries. So this meeting, um, you know, we, we moved things away from quarterly to every other month because we have so much on our agenda. So many of these conversations are just continued dialogue. Um, and we want to make sure that we're prepared um, to take any action as a board um, going forward. So you'll see a lot of quarterly, um, but it's not really quarterly. Jay and I need to kind of finesse how we're going to change the quarterly reports to work every other month. Um, 
But the most important thing we've got to do today, I think, is talk about rates and fees. So, Jay, do you want to introduce Julie for us? I will. So, um, first of all, thank you for serving, being here with us uh, today. And uh, Councilwoman DeVore, thank you for sitting in on this. I will um, introduce Julie Crawford, who's the Director of Financial Planning and Analysis and takes care of budgets, planning, rates, capital, O&M, um, her group is responsible for the operating reports that you get each month. And um, I think that, uh, as you said, this is a introduction. It's really not an introduction. We talked briefly about it the last time. Um, this is the next step in the process. And we'll talk a little bit about the schedule and the timing. Um, and I think that uh, Julie's got uh, some good information uh, and is open. We are open to um, questions as we go through this. So um, Julie, I'll, um, Turn it over to you uh, and thank you for being here too. Great, thank you, Jay. And good morning, Chair Lanahan and committee members. Um, like Jay said, we're just going to go through an update basically on our 12 month plan for rates and fees. All right, this is a very busy slide and I'll go through each topic one by one as we progress through the presentation. Uh, however, I wanted to first show the plan in its entirety. This is tentative, it's a tentative timeline of the changes and actions planned through the next year. We'll first address the electric fuel charge, then the electric base rate, and then the water and wastewater capacity fees. All right, first the fuel charge. The fuel charge is a rate designed to directly pass through fuel expenses, and the charge is evaluated annually, although it has not been adjusted in over four years. Our pricing policy states that the charge is established in concurrence with our budget. Should projections change drastically, which is plus or minus 10% or more, then the rate can be changed intra-year with board approval. Since the rate is established annually, but the commodity markets can swing quickly, as we all know, uh, we also have a stabilization fund that acts somewhat as a savings account we can draw from or deposit into through the year if expenses are higher or lower than expected. Our fund target is set within our pricing policy as 15% of the highest annual fuel expense over the past five years. Currently, the 15% is based off of our 2018 fuel expense of $455 million, resulting in a $68 million target for the fund. Our fiscal year 22 projections currently show a lower fuel cost than what is forecasted for this year mainly due to the FPL PPA that will replace Shear Unit 4 and also Vogel Unit 3 coming online and the beginning of the 250 megawatts of utility scale solar. As such, we are recommending a reduction in the fuel charge of $2 a megawatt hour from $32.50 a megawatt hour to $30.50 a megawatt hour. When this slide was prepared, um, this rate would lead to a fund balance of our target of 15% at the end of fiscal year 22. Recently, the forecast expenses have increased. However, we're still comfortable with this lower rate recommendation. And should our projections drastically change between now and the board approving the budget, we will adjust our recommendation. So, and this slide indicates the fuel, oh, I'm sorry. Do you have an update on the plant shear meeting yesterday? I mean, the plant bubble meeting yesterday. Does anybody? Hey, Joe, do do you have any bubble update? I think we have an update meeting next um, next week in our normal update meeting. Yeah, we have not received an update from the co-owners meeting yesterday, Bob. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt you guys. Thank you. No problem. Well, and, and Jay, um, you were going to check. I, I I was on the board when we put the fuel adjustment clause in, and I thought we passed it not requiring board approval, that it was just a pass through. So you you were going to do some investigation on that for me, right? We did, and, and it is. Uh, Julie, you can, well, you know what? It'll be easier for you to um, explain that uh, process. I think it's in the board approval of the uh, budget. Or the budget. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we, we, we weren't creating a, a separate approval process that it's confined within the budget. It's, it hasn't been changed in four years. Is that right, Julie? Um, and That's correct. 
we are going to continue to look at what the right uh, mechanism is. It should be more administrative. I think it should be more administrative than it is, and so we're going to work towards uh, towards that. I yeah, agree. that was the in, that was the intention when we put it in place. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Julie. Back to you. Sorry, yeah. we keep interrupting and, um, you. Oh no, you're you're fine. Um, this slide right here shows the um, the approval in June, and the reason it's in June is because that is when we will present the the board. Um, to approve the budget. So, yes, that is consistent with what we just talked about. All right, now on to electric base rate. All right, this section speaks to base rates, which is a term that encompasses all rates for all classes other than the fuel charge, essentially everything on a bill except for fuel and taxes and fees. When we presented our five-year plan in the fall, we showed a need for a base rate increase in fiscal year 22, essentially to recover a portion of the cost of Vogel Unit 3 coming online, um, and then in the future, Vogel Unit 3 and 4 coming online. Um, I want to note that the actual cost to be covered by base rates is between 100 and $170 million through 2025, as the table indicates in the green box. We have done a lot of work to mitigate a large portion of this by the closure of SJRPP, um, the agreement with um, FPL for their PPA replacing share unit four, low cost utility scale solar, and a very significant amount of debt reduction. And despite these efforts, a, a base rate increase is still needed. We have adjusted the recommended increase for fiscal year 22 from 4% to 3% since November. And when taking the fuel charge decrease into account, it will be a neutral impact to the bill for fiscal year 22. So, Jay, if you consider your capital projects, and I know it's more weighted toward the water and sewer, but on the electrical side, does this give you enough cushion there? Going from a 3% to a 4%? Yeah, it, it, and 4 to a 3 it does. 4% to a 3%. It does. And part of what um, um, Julie has um, talked about on the, actually, I think the next two slides up is going to be the um, cost of service analysis okay. that will have some adjustments in that. And there will be, um, I expect there'll be recommendations going forward in 23, four and five. Um, but we're not, we're not showing that on this presentation because we've got to be sure we get that in the right place. We should be okay. in good shape. This puts us in a good place to be able to move forward. Okay. Um, and then the, um, the slide that shows the residential bill impact, it also by moving the fuel and a, and increasing the base rate, it's a in essence a zero change for our residential yep. customers. Yep. Which I accidentally presented your next slide for you, Julie. Sorry. <laughs> you did. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. This this as Jay mentioned is an illustration of a typical residential bill that consumes a thousand kilowatt hours in a month. Comparing current versus proposed, there is a $2 increase to the energy charge and a $2 decrease to the fuel charge, totaling the same $108.50. Uh, the difference in the total after taxes and fees is due to the public service tax calculation, as some of some fuel expenses are exempt from that calculation. Julie, is, is it, I mean, it seems a shame to be this close to being the same and not being the same. And I, the, the, the rate payer doesn't care about the top stuff. They care about the bottom line. So we can, we can work. The difference in that is going to be in rounding. The interesting thing on this is that if we present this as an average 1,000 kilowatt hours, the number of days in the month and the weather is going to have a bigger impact on the actual bill than the than than this. But we can we'll spend some time looking at what to do. It, instead of three percent flat, it could be a two point nine nine, two point nine eight, or something like that to, to deal with that twenty. Cents. I don't know that it's important, but I know just... it's it it probably we'll we'll play around with that a little bit. It's a little circular calculation we'll have to do, but we'll look at that. Absolutely. All right, the plan has staff requesting the board call for a rate hearing to be held in July. The base rate changes will be proposed and if approved, will be effective October 1st. 
parallel to the base rate change, staff will continue to partner with Black & Beach, our rate consultant, on a full cost of service study and plan to have a final report by the end of the fiscal year. The, the report will include rate recommendations, which will be presented to the board following its completion. I want to note that stakeholder communication is critical when changes are made to the way we bill our customers and will be a very important part of the rate plan. All right, on to capacity fees. As you all recall, the topic of capacity fees and the increased cost for providing water and wastewater capacity was discussed at the December f and meeting. This slide summarizes the conclusions presented in that meeting as for the tentative recommended increases to the fees. JEA currently has an RFP out for rate consultants and we should have them on board next month. Following their review, we will move forward with a final fee recommendation. And once again, stakeholder communication is a top priority when it comes to changing pricing, and that will be part of the plan leading up to implementation. We will also come back and present recommendations regarding tap and meter fees, our 10 inch commercial meter pricing and irrigation rates. So this one, and this one, oh, this, this one ahead, is, is a more critical for our capital on the water and sewer. And I yeah, think we're yeah. in good shape. This is going to put us in good, good shape uh, as we move forward, but we've got to be sure everybody knows about it. Would, would the expectation be that if you raised it by this, what, $65 million of revenue, that you would reduce the water rates or this no. is to cover the... Uh, Nope. This is a capacity fee that is an uh, increase that hasn't been increased for um, 15 years. And it, it needs to be increased more regularly than that to cover our cost. Thank you. All right. And this slide just illustrates the timing of, of what we just went over, establishing the updated fees uh, come October 1st. All right. Any questions for me? Is, is this, again, administrative? I mean, this should be, or do you think this? Uh, the capacity fees are probably uh, less. Does the, the capacity fees require a, a rate hearing too, Julie? They do. Yes, sir, they, they do. do. Yes, they do, yeah. yeah. Okay, no, I just, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that the, the um, the cost of service study is really important as we move forward here. And I think that, I think we'll have a lot of data to react to um, and to educate the folks paying those capacity fees when, when we get that information. Yes. I expect it will be controversial. You know, it's, it, it's interesting, John. Um, you know, one of the larger, I mean, Roger Osteen, who's one of the largest, you know, developed residential development, he feels that it's something that needs to be, and he says, look, I'll help organize and help you get this thing through. He thinks it's, he says, we're under what St. John's and Nassau County is. I, I'm not sure about that, St. John's, and he says, you know, look, I'll organize developers and I'll work towards getting this thing through, which we've never had before. I would assume not, yeah. yeah. We. We are going into it assuming that um, some people are going to be okay with it and some people are not. And that's why the stakeholder communication is going to be important uh, to run through. Um, and the good news, I think it's important for the public to understand is this is a capacity fee that is uh, not part of the rates. This is not a normal monthly charge that they're paying. This is uh, capacity fee that's paid by builders on the front end of development to, in order to fund uh, the, the projects that are required to support the growth. Uh, and so it actually is a positive for our um, for our customers that are paying the monthly bill. But, but the other thing is, I mean, walking through it with Roger, he says, Bobby, you guys are not, you know, you're not, you should be getting more and we'll work towards educating with your team so yeah i mean any fee that hasn't been touched in 15 years um is probably subject to to go up a bit but it will be controversial john um it, it was in the past when we looked at it but i think it's time to do it 
Any yeah. any other questions for Julie? She's going to be on deck for the budget assumptions as well. Anything on on rates and fees? All right. Thank you, Julie. Let's move into budget assumptions. Thanks, Ray. Um, this presentation will be the first of several presentations on the proposed fiscal year 22 budget. Today, we will discuss high level assumptions and then we will have a final budget to present to the committee in May. And here's a quick look at the items we're going to cover, strategic items, key assumptions, and then we'll delve into the electric and water wastewater budget specifically, then government transfers and our timeline. It's important to note that the creation of the budget starts with the core priorities mentioned on the left. And in addition to these recurring priorities, fiscal year 22 will include an allowance for continual COVID expenses, the new headquarters, the changes resulting from the shutdown of Shear Unit 4, the finalization of the SJRPP remediation and subsequent pay down of debt, and a decrease in fuel expenses, which is resulting in a recommended lower fuel charge. All right, on to key assumptions. The biggest assumptions to establish for the fiscal year 22 budget are the total revenues we will request for appropriation. We kept the electric system sales projection consistent with the fiscal year 21 budget request at 12,800 gigawatt hours, which is a projection of 12,200 gigawatt hours with a 5% weather contingency adder. This results in a $1.35 billion budget compared to a $1.25 billion budget for fiscal year 21. The increase in revenues despite the flat sales assumption is a result of the $100 million expected from FPL that will be used to pay down shear debt and additional electric system debt. The water and wastewater system projection is assuming modest growth and with a 5% weather contingency adder results in 76,650,000 KGAL, resulting in a $539 million budget for fiscal year 22, compared to a $512 million budget in fiscal year 21. While the increase is mostly due to higher sales projections, fiscal year 22 also includes $9.4 million to appropriate a surplus from fiscal year 20. Did 21 have a 5% contingency as well? Yes, sir. So you're saying flat, but we've seen growth here in the last year. Is that taking into account this growth? Julie, the the growth on water is showing up. The um, that's what I'm talking about. The, it it is taking into account. Okay, that okay, okay. The electric has has remained flat, right? Correct. We are forecasting our sales for 21 to end around. 12-2, which is what the 22 budget is proposed. So we have seen customer growth, um, but I think we're we're anticipating the sales to somewhat remain the same, especially in a COVID environment. Um, we discussed bumping that up or leaving it flat, I think maybe for one more year to be conservative, we might um, leave it consistent since it seems like that's actually what's going to happen when we end fiscal year 21. Thank you. And Julie, it's confusing to me that we call <coughs> the 5% reduction is not our budget, but it is our budget, isn't it? Yes, so the projection is um, a realistic view of what we think we're going to sell. We do add then 5% on top of that to increase that sales number, to increase that uh, revenue appropriation, uh, just in case we do have an extreme weather year and sell more KGALs or more megawatt hours than we anticipated. And that's just so we have the revenues appropriated. Um, like I mentioned for water and wastewater, we included $9.4 million in this budget because in fiscal year 20, we sold more than we budgeted for. And so we couldn't use that 9.4 million until we appropriate it in this budget. So that 5% gives a little bit of wiggle room for if we sell more than we really think we're going to, we can then use that money to pay for capital or pay down debt, um, et cetera. 
That, Julie, is that that's because the the process that we use, where we have, the board approves it, then council approves it. Um, it has to be um, technically appropriated before we can um, spend it. So we put a buffer in, in case there's a, a, a extreme year that has more revenue that we need to be able to pay. So the the budget is what is labeled budget. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. got yeah. it. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's right. That was bad. Yeah. It's. <laughs> You know what I live like. <laughs> All right, Julie, keep going. All right, yes, ma'am. Uh, this was just reviewed in our previous presentation. However, the note here is that the proposed budget includes the fuel revenue reduction from the recommended lower fuel charge. All right, labor costs will include the negotiated contract amounts as well as an updated pension contribution. Last year was the first year we budgeted for pay for performance, and that was included in the budget, and we will continue to place an estimate in the budget this year. All right, on to electric. This chart represents the total electric system operating budget by category. The blue bars represent the fiscal year 22 budget estimate but are subject to change over the next two months as we work to refine our business needs. I've noted on the fuel and on the internal capital fund categories, not only the tentative budget, but also the anticipated level of spend should our sales projections hold true without extreme weather. The fuel expenses are anticipated to be higher than what was budgeted in fiscal year 21. However, they still indicate a need to lower the fuel charge. The O&M at $250 million is currently just an estimate as the deadline for all of the business requests is actually today. And my team will review and have feedback with business owners to refine that O&M number. The non-fuel purchase power category encompasses generation expenses for plant shearer, SGRPP, and plant vogel that are not fuel related. The large majority of this increase in budget is due to the $75 million debt retirement for plant shearer, as well as plant vogel unit three coming online. The internal capital funds are funds available after all other expenses are met to either pay for capital expenses or to contribute to the capital fund for future year spend. And then moving down the line, the debt service budget is just slightly higher than last year by $4 million. And our city contribution is projected based on our agreement with the city. Um, I will note that that other category seems like a very big delta. And that is just a result of our fiscal year 21 budget allowing a large stabilization fund deposit into the fuel fund. And then this year we are budgeting um, a very small withdrawal from that fund. So that is the delta in that other category. Yeah, my, my question is a for-profit utility. Do they still have the stabilization fund? How, how do they account for this? Hey. Joe, did the uh, uh, investor owned would have a stabilization fund too? Um, is that uh, typically not? They tend to uh, adjust these fuel rates more frequently. They have an, many have an automatic fuel adjustment, so they they may do it as frequently as monthly. So you wouldn't see the kind of uh, stabilization fund required because they're they're basically taking into account current commodity price so that's part so the when when we talked about um, is the fuel adjustment administrative yeah the other question is um, that I think we need to spend some time is looking at we changed it because it used to be that it was a 15 percent of the largest ever uh, yes. and now it's of the last five years that's still a, a big number. That's why we're comfortable with with moving this down a little bit. So, what is the right amount, and what should it be? Is another part that, of the. That's that's my question. Yeah. Is what should be? I mean, uh, I and think should we look at adjusting like the for profits on a more regular basis because we're tying up cash? Does that make sense? It does. We need to have some amount of reserve in there, and that's part of the study that we need to figure yeah. out. And I mean, then we also need to look at the complexities of changing a bill every single month, there's some impact that has on customers on how often we change that. But the but our industrial and large customers would appreciate that a lot. Uh, 
So we'll. I, I just. It, yep. I think it needs to go yeah. in that direction. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm sorry to no, stop good. you guys. No, that's. It's a big. It's an important thing. It's a lot of dollars tied up in. That's a good question. All right, the electric system is currently targeting a spend of $197 million this fiscal year and is planning a fiscal year 22 budget of approximately $250 million to be partially funded from fiscal year 22 revenues and partially from capital fund balances. The fiscal year 22 number will be refined in the next two months through several meetings. Ricky is very involved um, in these meetings and we meet with the business owners and they present every single project that has been in fiscal year 22. And we discuss prioritization and accuracy of estimates so that we land on a very solid project list. So that, um, that recommendation will be refined and will be um, final come May when we come to present to the committee the final budget. All right, on to water and wastewater. Julie, let me ask you a question. What sure. all? Page 33, we talk about fiscal 21 budget for internal capital funds being 291 million. Yes. And then on page 34, we say 197. So we are planning to spend 197 on capital. However, we budgeted to have $291 million available from current year revenues to spend on capital. So that difference, to make up that difference, if we really do, well, actually it's not a difference, it's a large difference, that will go into the capital fund that's available to be used the following year on capital projects. How do we come up with that magic? So that, that's a great question. The, those internal funds, you know, we, we established the assumptions at the beginning on the revenues. That's really the number that's appropriated. And then you fit um, the line items of expenses within that appropriation. And while the majority of our expenses are, um, you know, steady and dependable, um, the, the difference after we budget for our O&M and for our debt service, et cetera, is the, the leftover funds will be allocated to that internal uh, that internal fund to be used for capital, or that money can also be used for debt pay down. Okay, thank you. So the extra You're balance welcome. is for Julie. If I could add to that, when we adjusted the base rate back in 2017, we we had anticipated Volvo Unit 3 and 4 coming online in fiscal years 19 and 20, as opposed to now 21 and 22. So we have been generating a little ex excess cash because of that base rate increase, and we've used that cash to pay down debt. And when, when I uh, address our cash balances, I'll comment we just defeated another large amount of debt. So, so that's really what's been going on really to create this cushion for the Vogel PPA from MEAG when it comes online at the end of this year and, and next year. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome, sir. Great. All right, water and wastewater. This chart is very similar to the electric chart, um, and it represents the total water and wastewater system operating budget by category. Uh, once again, the blue bars represent our fiscal year 22 budget estimate, um, and we'll, we will refine those over the next couple months. And um, also noted on that internal capital funds is the anticipated level of spend should our sales projections hold true without weather, as well as based on our budget sales. Um, the O&M at $182 million is currently the current estimate, but also will be refined, as I mentioned on the electric slide. Our debt service budget is slightly higher than last year by $2 million, and our city contribution budget is based on the agreement we have with the city. One other item to note on here is 
We have not typically budgeted for annual interlocal payments, as you can see in the chart without a bar for fiscal year 21. However, our agreement with Nassau County will require a 10 year prepayment in fiscal year 22, in addition to the other annual payments we make to St. John's County and Clay County. For water and wastewater um, capital, they're currently estimating to spend $254 million this fiscal year and planning a budget of approximately $395 to be funded partially from two fiscal year 22 revenues and partially from the revolving credit facility. Um, Joe would like me to note that the revolving credit facility is just an interim step before we issue new bonds. Um, the, this number, just like I mentioned on electric, will be refined over the next two months as um, the budget team, high and all of the business owners meet to go over each and every project that we'll have spent in fiscal year 22, and we will uh, prioritize and discuss estimates and land on a solid project list to be presented um, in May when we come back to the committee. Jay, will the, will the board get a presentation on these big CapEx? appropriate time yes this is the first kind of the introduction of the budget there'll be multiple um, opportunities for you to see a lot more information as we move forward so, so I mean this is something that you know to me the yields curve starting to move and you know we've got quite a bit of capital that we're going to be spending should we go ahead and borrow at these rates early if we're going to spend this kind of money that's joe that's part of the question that we need to work through over the next couple of months is you've got the revolving credit that will move in but how much should we borrow and what's the timing of our borrowing is is a question we need to tackle over the next couple of months i just you know, yeah. i mean this person i don't feel comfortable using you know a lot of credit for fund capital just that's just until we get until we get to the spot. It's a short term. That's okay. a short that that should really be a short term, very is, short, short very, term. And it, we've got it is. And, yeah. and the investment rates are so low right now that we're we're giving up about two hundred basis points for every long term bond that we issue right now. So we have to weigh the negative carry on borrowing immediately versus um blending in in over time. Yeah, but I, we're not in the interest rate business and I, I live through the inflation days and I'm and I'm just trying to think through this. Well, and, and we've invited Michael Mace from PFM is on our agenda for um, today for, for a little bit. So I think I think it's a great time to have that conversation. Yeah, but let me just finish this statement, Marty, because I, I appreciate that. And I want to get this, but you know, once rates move, you can't get in front of them. And I, you know, working, I lived through 15% interest rate environment and 12% interest rate environment. And I just, we've never seen this for the last 10 years in the history of my life and business. And I just, I think we can put this to bed and focus on our business. I'd, I'd rather pay a little bit more to, to have you know, because once interest rates move, you can't get in front of them. Yeah, I think that's part of the analysis we need to do as we go through the budget process over the next couple of months. Yeah. The question is, given the last week, is a couple of months too long? Is that what you're saying, Bobby? I mean, John, that's, I, I mean, I, I, great, I appreciate presentations. I've just, I've got scars on my back from those days and I don't want to be you know I, I want to be thoughtful here but everybody's talking about you know 20 basis points and you know it's it just seemed you know we just did a 1.9 trillion dollar stimulus this is five trillion dollars we put into the system I, I just think we got to be very thoughtful here because we're a capital intensive business and I'm you know Marty you you live it every day um, but I just want to put that in the back of everybody's mind. Um, and I don't know what others think. I mean, Jay, what do you think? Because we're going to be spending a billion and a half dollars. 
Yeah, and our balance sheet is in very good shape. But, you know, you go from the rates they are today to where you talk about 5%, it makes a big difference. If you go to 10%, it goes to a big difference. It does. And part of what Mike Mace is going to talk about is, is it, his focus is on the variable side of this. Um, the bigger question is if there's a long-term change, what are we going to do for the borrowing going forward? Um, and so we've got to rely on all the different um, measures and look at some uh, some level of what is the impact? What's the sensitivity to our entire portfolio? And so Joe and his team will look at that. We, we're not in a position to make a decision. This isn't a weak decision. Even if there's a change that happens, then um, we've got to look at this on the, the longer haul mm -hmm. and look at the timing of when we are going to spend the money and what the timing is. So I think all of that's going to come in, come together and we'll be in good shape to, um, to answer the questions. Um, but we need to be thoughtful about how we move forward uh, with it. And, and it's an important um, issue to bring up, Bobby. And I, I think that we just need to be prepared to be nimble if we see something moving. And I think currently the way we've got it structured, we, we do have a great deal of flexibility to do something if we needed to do it pretty quickly. And, and I agree with you, Marty, that's a good point, but I just keep saying to people, you know, people are focused on minimal increases. I'm saying once this thing moves, it's hard to get in front of it. And I think it, as you say, Jay, is what are, what are our capital needs? Yeah. And we're not in the interest rate business. We're in the water and sewer and electrical business. Yeah. And if we pay a little bit more for insurance, I'd rather do that. That's just me personally. And I'm, I, I think I'm that's, not, I think that's the, the balance that we've got to make to be sure that we're, um, we're able to make that long-term decision. We're working off of the um, rules and guidelines that we put in place after 2008-9. Um, and so Joe and I have talked about this a lot, about what the what the right uh, decisions are. Um, our focus has been and continues to be pay down, pay down, pay down debt. And um, that's been exactly the right thing. It's put us in a strong position to even be able to have this discussion. The flexibility to be able to do this is because of the decisions we made up to this point. And I think we can keep on making good decisions. That's I, I, I just, very good points. No, but I I think we have the flexibility. I just want to make sure we continue. Yeah. yeah. All right, Julie, back to you. Yes, ma'am. All right, on to government transfers. This slide illustrates the history of total government transfers made via the JEA bill, as well as anticipated totals for fiscal year 22. The uh, estimated total is $309 million, and 253 million of that will stay local and go to the city of Jacksonville. All right, on to timeline. My team will continue to work with the business and refine the 22 budget, and we will have final recommendations at the May FNA meeting. Following that meeting, we will present the plan to the board, and then we'll request approval in June. Um, our deadline for submission to the city is July 1st. Jay, the, on page 39, it talks about our city of Jacksonville payments equal $252 million. Um, we talk, whenever I see anything in the public, it talks about the, the, the uh, city contribution of 121. Yeah. And if our, if the citizens of Jacksonville understood that it was not 121, but it's 252, you know, that changes the the whole thought about the need to sell uh, JEA at some point. And um, I just think our rate paper payers need to be educated about that because I can remember saying, well, you know, if we're only getting 121 million and we could sell, sell JEA and get three times that much, why wouldn't we do that? And if the answer is, well, you wouldn't get three times as much. It would, I mean, it's just crazy not to have that be a well-known number. Yeah, That's I, all I'm saying. I think 
um, how we communicate uh, with the how we're partnering with the city is going to continue to be important. Some of those, I'm going to, I shouldn't make uh, this statement because I'm not 100% sure, but I think some of those numbers below above the 120 would have been those are public service taxes and gross receipt taxes and things that would have been paid by a private um, to. Um, so, okay. But so, but I think that um, the difference. Your point is valid in that we spend a lot of time breaking. It's the same thing with the fuel charge. It works for us, and we we do that. Our message to staff is we need to be easier to do business with, um, and the fact that we know a lot about where all the numbers go matters less to the people that are having to pay the bill when they get one number at the bottom. And so, how much of the of the number at the bottom is helping support? Positive things across the whole city is kind of the way I think we should spend that well, and, and put that together. You said it a lot better than um, me. But and, the, and, good point. Yeah. And Jay, we did year and again. This is years ago. Looked at um, if we were not municipally owned and we were paying property taxes, um, would we be paying more in property taxes than the city contribution? And and again, dated it. It appeared at the time that we would pay less. Than the contribution amount, so there there's an argument that that maybe you know we should take a look at that again if it's helpful. So that comes up again in 2023, well, 2024 um, timeline, right. um, and and um, I think that the focus needs to be the partnership part, and this doesn't include things like the um, dollars that we're helping support uh, septic tanks with that is a, a contribution uh, as well. The funding that we do for um, OIG and others is not included. So there's things that we are also doing that, again, I don't think that the um, the customer that is having to pay our bill every month uh, necessarily uh, is going to care what the breakdown is, uh, but how we support each other and support what we're doing um, going forward is, um, is good. Um, and I think that's a positive thing. But we've got a good relationship with the city, so we're going to keep on doing that. That's really the focus today. Good stuff. All right. So we've got the timeline. And, and that is it for me, unless there are any other questions or feedback. Great job. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you, Julie. Um, Steve, audit services update. Yeah, thank you, Chair Lanahan. Good morning again, everybody. Uh, I'm going to move quickly through the three areas within audit services, what we've been doing in the, uh, what we did in the last quarter, uh, starting with enterprise risk management. This first page, the next few pages actually refer to some of the goals, both real and aspirational. Uh, the first page actually uh, is speaking to, well, really kind of we want to get back to kind of focusing on the refining the quantitative uh, metrics around the, the various risks we've identified. Uh, I think we mentioned at the December meeting, uh, starting with the risk working committee using the three lines of defense. Uh, I was talking with Frank Benedetto, our manager of ERM the other day, and he thinks the best place for the, uh, the working committee to start is with environmental risks. So we'll probably be reaching out soon to Wayne's team as well as uh, Ricky and I's to kind of, that's going to be a very collaborative effort. So we'll start working there. Uh, also, we're going to try to get back to more strategic alignment uh, with the risk with uh, what's going on strategically with the company. And then also the, uh, the executive oversight group, the ECRC, uh, trying to figure out an optimal cycle for the ERM team to loop back uh, how frequent for how long to provide updates. Uh, this one is kind of some of more of the aspirational things, some of the incentives uh, around uh, maybe some corporate goals or putting some additional information in job descriptions. And then also uh, some tools that would help the risk owners uh, more along KPIs and KRIs, perhaps an automated GRC system, and uh, doing more with confirming uh, risk tolerance criteria. And this page just kind of gives the whole suite of the various, uh, both uh, in progress and current, uh, training is used, everything from a 20-minute computer-based training all the way through a full-day session. 
Now, this page is actually one that hasn't changed in a while. Probably the most noteworthy thing on this page is the very last sentence in the box at the bottom is that you all last saw this with the full board back in April of last year. So kind of where we're talking about kind of refining the quantitative measures. I think there's certainly an opportunity to kind of revise, re-rank, and uh, represent this maybe at the next meeting or two. So this is where it stands. It hasn't changed a lot, but we expect there'll be some shifting among the various uh, lists here. The, the only thing I'll stop you is this damn cyber thing, I, I, I keep coming back to it. Yep. And I, I think it's got to be front of mind because it can shut in so many different ways, shut an operation down. And we have a, a, a update that we're planning on in April at the April board meeting to update you on the um, on cyber specifically. Uh, and then as far as this uh, top 10 risk, it was done. I think Steve said April of last year is when it was presented. So that means it was developed in the spring of, of last year. Um, and what we are, um, uh, what we're working towards with Enterprise Risk and Steve and Jody and I um, and his team met is to line up the, be sure that the risk are things that we're actually working on that are lined up. So cyber, for example, that we, uh, that we have plans in place to address those risks and not just to report to you that this is a risk. Yeah. So those are, but cyber is a key um, component and April board, April board meeting. meeting, we'll be bringing a presentation to you about our policies and procedures and what we are doing on the, on your concern about cyber. I just, I would do it every meeting, even for, for two minutes, because I, it's got to be front of mind. And today, I don't know if you saw the solar winds and how it infiltrated the whole, and these guys will be in litigation for a long, long time. Yeah. So, so nobody can even question yep. what we're doing. I mean, you're talking about so many different, in, you know, input points from transmission lines to, you know, customers. So I just, I hate to be bringing that up. But I, I think if it makes you feeling better, there's a couple of other board members that also bring it up um, and we will continue to, to I, I think we've got a good, um, good system in place, but we need to be sure you know that we have the good system in place and then it changes every, it changes so regularly, we've got to stay on top of it, you're right. Well, and, and when Jay, you and I have spoken about it in the past, what, what we've kind of talked about is we're really good with hurricanes. That's that's the kind of risk that we always have and we, we know how to workshop around that, but should we do a practice run on what if there was a cyber attack? How would we respond? Um, and maybe maybe start doing some um, some scenario planning around um, risks that are not just hurricane related. And that yes, and that that is not just cyber. That is also the cold weather, the Texas issues, and some of the other things. And that's we talked at the last board meeting the idea of the resiliency beyond hurricanes. And this is a piece of that that we've got a team started to um, to look at that. Um, so all of these things need to be updated regularly and tied back to goals and objectives yeah, and yeah, that we're yeah, actually yeah, accomplishing yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Uh, the investigative team. Real quick, the main thing, I always like to give a shout out to our new uh, team members. Uh, Susan Bowen has uh, been on board about two weeks. She's a former JSO lieutenant, good, very, uh, Business experience, a great ad. She's going to do a super job for us. We do have another open. The last open audit services position is the other senior forensic auditor. So we'll come back to that, uh, do a new recruitment probably in the coming weeks. And then uh, while that might speak to this briefly, because she was the project manager, we've actually upgraded after about 15 years to a new uh, platform with Navix Global for the ethics hotline. It's on one called Ethics Point. Investigative statistics, uh, two open cases actually, uh, and actually the, the first case, actually we have an exit meeting internally on this afternoon. I got the invite about 30 minutes ago. So uh, things are kind of moving here again. And then some, some notes on the closed cases. Uh, Julie Moore uh, for uh, working on the upgrade for the uh, hotline system, and then obviously trying to staff up. So no closed cases, but as I mentioned, uh, that uh, number will pick back up again this coming quarter. Okay, internal audit is kind of more straightforward. Uh, no, no changes there. Just kind of continuing on with the audit work. 
some of the highlights here, the uh, TEA, we finished our third and final year of the in-charge engagement. Obviously, we're the local utility, our first time as the in-charge for that member review. Uh, we thought for a while that we might be uh, taking city utilities place. Uh, they were going to succeed us. They've had some churn in their audit ranks, but it turns out that uh, Santee Cooper is actually going to be our successor in charge. So we don't have to do the fourth year. And then the QAR, it's every five years. Uh, that's going to come late this year. Uh, hopefully, this will be our fourth one, so hopefully that goes well for us. A little summary here just on the TEA member review. And then here's the audit calendar. Obviously, as the blue dot slide from left to right, we're kind of where we need to be. We're in the middle of the second quarter. And uh, so as we move through the year, we'll be populating uh, you know, the uh, in progress or completed reports as we go there. Okay, uh, these are the, uh, and again, I always mention every, every meeting that the, uh, the volume of open action plans ebbs and flows. I think it was closer to 50, 50 last quarter. It's dropped to 39. You can see the distribution based on the issue rating across all the enterprise. And by the way, this is at the end of January. And this breaks down by the new organizational structure. Uh, you can see Chief Operating Officer, Chief Customer Officer, CHRO, CFO, and then Chief Administrative Officer. Steve, why? Yes, sir. Sorry. Why does CFO office have so many? Well, I'm going to get the actually, that's the next slide. Okay. There's a little there's a little bit of depth there with at the ELT level uh, between supply chain operate, operations support, the chief information officer, and then obviously uh, the uh, VP of financial services. Typically, uh, just because of the uh, the uh, technology group usually has the highest number of issues, just because uh, we've, got, we've got a good auditor in there, that area, and usually because uh, a lot of them are system related, so they take a little bit longer to uh, to clear the finish line, but uh, that's kind of the reason why uh, the CFO has a few more is because, again, there's a little more depth there at the ELP level. It is It is not because of uh, uh, failure to respond. No, no, everybody does real well in that regard. It's just that, like I say, a lot of it's just timing in that uh, this depends on how recently we issued a report and how long it takes to um, satisfactorily mitigate an issue. This is, um, there's a money um, and stuff and cyber <laughs> in, that, in that group. And so whenever you have all of the supply chain, um, all of the finance and all of the technology in one group, it's gonna have a higher um, focus. Yeah. That you. makes sense. Jay, this is Joe, to address financial services in particular, <laughs> these four items are related to insurance risk management and Steve and his team had not, I don't believe they had looked at insurance risk management for a number of years. And I would consider these findings to be more ministerial in nature. They do not involve our processes around cash disbursements, accounts payable, the typical accounting, the typical finance related matters that you might see. Yeah, and to add to Joe's point, if you see the shades of green, those are the two lower rated issue rankings. That's a good story there. So uh, like Joe said, you know, ministerial, it's a good, great degree. Okay, the last slide here, and this is just a carryover and a kind of segue into something I'm going to say next, is uh, we requested a few years ago by a prior committee to put in any uh, critical or major issues. We never issued a critical rating issue. But this is the one major dealing with service, uh, sewer flow meters. Uh, it's a little complex, uh, it's gonna take some time, a couple of phases to, for the mitigation to clear. Uh, so that's the status of that. But uh, just, in, just to close out, uh, every, my managers and I, we uh, meet, you know, we figure every couple of three years is a good time to kind of kind of reset, reset <laughs> what we present. And we certainly invite the committee, if there's any metrics or any statistics that you're not seeing in our report, please let us know and uh, then we can include those. But we're probably starting maybe with the May committee meeting, having some maybe new types of reports that uh, hopefully are more informative than even what we've provided today. And unless there's any questions, that's all I have. Thank you. Any questions?
Whoops. You're still Can you coming. hear me? Yeah. yeah, I don't know no why you look muted, but you are still coming through. Okay, yeah, I, I look muted on my phone as well. Um, okay, the, um, no questions for Steve. We'll move on with the ethics. Good morning. Good morning. I want to give you a quick update on what's happening on the ethics front this morning. As part of uh, Jay's effort to continue to build and maintain our speak up culture, um, there was a need to kind of see what was happening on the best practice front. So here I've identified in terms of a due diligence checklist of the things that they recommend in terms of a strong ethics program. And I'm happy to say that all these things listed, we are doing them and, have, and doing them quite well here at JEA. So I will expand on all of those in my next few slides. Here are some of the tools that we have in place to sustain our ethical culture, one being the code of conduct, conduct excuse me, in which the board approved last December, um, which was great because it is a tool that will help us build a stronger reputation around integrity and hopefully help foster a greater employee loyalty and retention. So it is a, an active tool that employees can access at any time. Having our JA hotline in place, which is, was intended to provide a means for our JA employees to anonymously report unethical behavior. So there is no recording on the phone or tracing devices. It is completely anonymous, maintained by a third party vendor. And then lastly, having myself as a resource 24 seven to allow employees to contact me if they have any questions or any issues or things that they're confused about. Next are some additional things that we're doing to elevate the ethical culture. Again, having me to seek guidance to um, in terms of questions. One of the training topics that we have in place this year um, is been around practice of ethical decision making. And this is very key in terms of allowing our employees to understand what it means to think ethically and how to make good decisions before they take action. Um, to determine things such as, is the action required? Is it legal? Does it comply with our company policies? Um, does it align with our company values? So all those types of things are the questions they can ask themselves before making decisions to ensure that they are doing ethical things. And then lastly, the upgrade of our hotline. As Steve mentioned earlier, we have implemented a new um, hotline um, access it is a cloud-based application called Ethics Point. We're very excited. It has rolled out. We will do a full company rollout in May. Um, but with this new upgrade, employees will be able to not only call, but they'll be able to go online and report. And also there is a mobile app that they will be able to report utilizing as well. Next is something I'm very excited to announce. Uh, we have implemented in January our ethics badge, and it's part of our new pride program where we utilize it as a tool to recognize employees when they're doing something ethical. And I'm happy to say that I'm not the only one using the badge. Uh, several employees have uh, given out badges among each other. It is a peer-to-peer -peer badge, so I'm very excited that we have something in place to recognize each other. Here is the five-year view that I show each quarter, just to kind of keep you in the loop of what's happening um, in terms of volume. This is a five-year back look and from FY17 to today. Um, as you know, we're in, we just ended first quarter of FY21. So at the end, I had 22. Right now, we're near the end of second quarter. And um, when I last checked yesterday, we we're still at 22. So we'll have a 22 additional for second quarter, but we have a few more days in the quarter. So we'll wait and see. Um, I've been getting inquiries regularly due to the training that's taken place, which has been great. Next is the categories broken down for FY21 and the previous years. And as you will see year to date for FY21, the largest number of inquiries is the secondary employment. And I will say the two top ones this quarter have been around military leave. Again, um, employees understanding that is military leave is not required for them to put down a secondary employment. Also, that includes the reserves. And then I get several inquiries around rental properties um, at secondary employment as well. Okay. 
And here, I wanted to provide you a sample. I believe Chair Baker asked a question last quarter in regards to what type of cases that I received. So I thought it was good to kind of highlight and provide some sample case questions and resolutions for you in some of the various categories that I get questions on. Um, and as you'll see in some of their questions, many times employees know the answer, but they just want to validate it. So it's always good to have them be able to answer the question themselves, and I just confirm that their answer is correct. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And then what's coming up? Uh, we are in the process of finalizing our hotline um, system upgrade. We will be trans uh, migrating over our legacy data to the system sometime by the end of this month. We'll be testing that um, piece as well, and then we'll be putting out a full communication plan to the employees to let them know about all the different ways they can access the hotline. Uh, right now, we rolled out our business ethics refresher training, which is an annual training that all employees are required to take. It rolled out March 1st. Um, we have about uh, 60 days was given to employees to take the training due to COVID situation. We wanted to allow them to have additional time instead of our normal 30 days. And I'm happy to report that almost 45% of our employees have already taken the training and we're just on March 12th, so that's excellent. But I will be making follow-up starting May 1 with anyone who's outstanding. Uh, third quarter, we're working with Carla Miller to implement our action plan item from our ethics workshops that we did for all managers last year. Our topic this quarter will be around happiness. And um, Carla and I are exploring some work done by um, Jonathan Hott, who is actually a professor in um, NYU around happiness hypothesis. And it will focus on the optimistic versus the pessimistic. So that'll be a tool we'll be providing to our managers in the third quarter of this year. And then lastly, I'm working with procurement to help them update their conflict of interest form. So that ends my presentation. Is there any questions at this time? Great job. All right, thank you. How many badges have you passed out, Wallet? And in you know, that, that's a fun thing to do. What, what are the situations that they've been um, passed out for? Well, I've been giving most of mine out to um, employees that I go to to help me with some of my ethical um, information that I put out. For example, I had several employees that I approached to help me with the ethics training to kind of pilot it, to review it, so I gave them a badge. Um, I had an employee who had a, um, a coworker who had a question around their secondary employment and the employee actually answered the question for them. So they sent them a badge for that. So um, nothing major, but I'm just happy that we have it there as a tool just to kind of allow employees to recognize each other from a peer-to-peer -peer standpoint. Yeah, no, that's nice. Thank you for that. And it's, it's, it's always nice. You do such a great job um, in making sure that our associates know where to go if they have questions. So I'm, I'm glad we're gonna have even an easier way for them to do that go forward. Absolutely. All right, next um, we've got Joe up talking about the reserve fund and um, I've referenced Michael Mace from PFM. Um, we'll be talking about the variable rate um, debt analysis. Great, good morning. <laughs> Chair Lanahan and committee members. Uh, this report is provided for transparency and full disclosure about all of JEA's reserve funds. Each fund supports bond resolution requirements, credit ratings, or operational needs. Reserve fund balances also support maintaining metrics required to keep our credit rating stable and our debt costs low. Uh, for the electric system, Julie talked about the fuel rate stabilization fund balance. Project it ended fiscal year 2020 at approximately 73 million. As noted on page 78 of the package, the fuel fund balance is projected to decline slightly to approximately 71 million by fiscal year end 2021. And our fuel management folks as of Tuesday afternoon are, are now projecting a further reduction to approximately 62 million due to higher commodity prices. Uh, again, to questions raised earlier, based on uh, projected fuel spend uh, for this year, we still think 
that this level at 62 is just under 16 percent of the fuel spend estimated for this year. So we'll continue to revisit this analysis. Earlier, Ju Julie addressed our recommendation to lower the fuel charge by $2 to 3050, and the non-fuel purchase power rate stabilization fund reflects the funding of approximately 36 million during the remaining portion of fiscal year 2021, 34 million and a slight 2 million in the next fiscal year for principal payments on MEAG Project J bonds projected to, to be, I'm sorry, that we, we will be billed for prior to the projected in-service dates of November 21 and November 22. Days of liquidity projected at 315 days at fiscal year in 2021 remains comfortably above our pricing policy target of 150 to 250 days. In the restricted fund balances, the renewal and replacement, what we call R&R, and operating capital outlays, which is OCO, are projected to be relatively flat at fiscal year end 2021. This is after having defeased or retired approximately 104 million of electric system variable rate and fixed rate bonds during the past week and a half. And of that 104 million, 75 million of that defeasance was variable rate debt. And uh, Mike Mace will address that shortly. On the water and sewer system side, days of liquidity projected at 353 days at fiscal year end 2021 remain significantly above our pricing policy target range of at least 100 days. Further, given the projected R&R fund balance of approximately 43 million at fiscal year end 2021, I have indicated at prior committee meetings about the upcoming need for new debt issuance. And we talked about timing on that new debt issuance, but we'll be partially funding the approximate $395 million capital program that Julie spoke about for fiscal year 22. And that's roughly $145 million higher than the fiscal year 2021 projected capital spend of approximately $250 million. Julie's team continues to vet the capital spend figures for the remainder of fiscal year 2021 and for the full year 2022 with Hai Vu and his team. As she pointed out, she works closely with Ricky Erickson and his team on the electric side as well. But we're, we're cer certainly focused on the capital spend in both systems. And, and that con concludes my prepared remarks and I'll, I'll entertain any questions that you may have. Any questions for Joe? Joe, um, I think I know the answer to this, but I'll, I'll ask it anyhow. You see the total electric system going from 778 to 485 um, between 18 and 21, and a similar drop in the wastewater. What What is driving, what made us decide to reduce these uh, so dramatically? Excellent question. Uh, we decided that in, in the past, we had kept the R&R &R OCO balances at approximately $150 million for each system. And we decided that since we were on a pay-go program for capital, that having that cash sitting around for a rainy day what was in effect double insurance. And at that time, we also decided to increase our revolving credit facility by 200 million to 500 million, just to give us added liquidity to, to maintain that liquidity in the form of credit as opposed to cash. And the negative carry that we were incurring back in the 15 to 17 time frame was significant, over 200 basis points difference between the uh, cost of our debt and our investment returns. So it was a concerted effort to shrink investments, pay down debt. We use a lot of this, these reserve balances, including uh, not, not just R and R OCO, but um, also we had debt management rate stabilization funds as well that, that we determined to be uh, superfluous as well. But a very good question. It was a concerted effort to reduce cash balances. I mean, to, 
while maintaining liquidity and cash balance is consistent with our rating. So I'd like to point that out. We, we didn't raid the cupboards bare. Okay. So this, this was not a result of nefarious actions of a prior administration. That is correct. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Joe, you want to move on with the um, variable rate conversation? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm delighted to introduce Michael Mays. Uh, to begin with, PFM Financial Advisors LLC is a leading municipal financial advisory firm in the United States. They have roughly 600 professionals dedicated to meeting the borrowing and investment needs of the governmental and not-for-profit sectors. Mr. Mace joined PFM in 2001 <coughs> with nearly 20 years of public finance and public power experience gained while working with major investment banking firms. He is located in the Charlotte, North Carolina office and leads PFM's national public power practice. During his 20 years at PFM, Mike has focused exclusively on providing financial advisory services to many of the largest governmentally owned utilities in the country to include Bonneville Power Administration, Electric Cities of North Carolina, ourselves, Long Island Power Authority, MEAG Power, the Power Authority of the State of New York, SMUD, or Sacramento Municipal Utility District, Salt River Project, and Santee Cooper. Of note is the fact that PFM also serves as a financial advisor to the city of Jacksonville to an earlier question regarding uh, the property taxes versus contributions to the city. Uh, PFM has pro provided analyses in the past that do support uh, Madam Chair's uh, comments regarding the fact that property taxes would indeed bring in lower revenues relative to the contribution to the city. Uh, Mr. Mace has worked with the American Public Power Association and the Large Public Power Council on several occasions by serving as a conference speaker and assisting in the advancement of utility industry priorities. Mr. Mace graduated from Dartmouth College and received an MBA from the Fuqua School of Business at Duke University. With that, Mike, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Joe. I'll try to keep my uh, presentation a little bit shorter than that bio, but thank you. Uh, so this morning we will talk about the variable rate debt portfolio and build somewhat on some of the discussions you've had previously. And what we will cover today is we'll talk about the, the portfolio and uh, some of the various products that are out there. We'll talk about some of the risk and considerations of variable rate debt and look at JEA in comparison to some of its peers and then summarize and address any questions. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll try to keep my remarks brief. I'll hit the highlights of many of the slides, but please feel free to stop me and ask questions, as I'm sure you will. This is a history of both long-term fixed rate and short-term variable rates in the muni market. The green line is a short-term municipal index that reflects the way a lot of very short paper would trade weekly reset bonds close to where commercial, shorter commercial, commercial paper would be. The red line would have been the long-term fixed rates for a AAA rated 30-year bond at the time. So for JEA, a AA rated utility system, those rates would be a little bit higher than the red line. And we're looking back or looking over a period of about 15 years here. And this tells the story of both the attraction and concern about variable rate debt. You see the large part of the graph where the green line is substantially below the red line, and that's been the benefit for being in short-term debt. But you also see some very vivid spikes when you had the financial crisis of 2008 and 9. You had the, the COVID uh, economic shutdown and very uh, severe credit concerns early in 2020, and those were periods where interest rates spiked severely. It was difficult to place this debt so these are it's a period of favorability and tranquility there in the middle that's uh, bookended by some very difficult but fortunately short times for variable rate debt but you see generally over the last 15 years variable rate debt has been very low cost 
and well below fixed rate rate. Now, to commission or Director Stein's earlier comments, if you roll the tape back on this graph and look into the late 90s, you would have seen that green line generally up around three and four percent. If you roll it back further into the 80s, you would have seen it up into five and six percent and early 80s, you know, quite high, occasionally hitting almost 10 percent for tax exempt variable rate debt. On this page, we have a summary of some of the forms of variable rate debt and the ones that JEA has used. I won't go into detail on all of them, but they're commonly uh, uh, recognized forms of variable rate debt, commercial paper. Most of what JEA has is variable rate demand bond that gets bonds that get reset on a periodic basis. So they're long-term bonds, but the rates are reset either daily, weekly, or uh, you know, at various times in a CP mode, and the holder is allowed to put them back and get them remarketed and get their money back pretty much whenever they want. And you also have 200 million roughly directly placed with a bank on a floating rate basis. The totals at the bottom, I think you're familiar with those numbers, those represent gross amounts of variable rate debt in each one of the respective systems and then that amount of debt in relation to the overall debt of the system. So you see 31% of the electric system as variable and about 20% of water and sewer as variable. And these are relatively high numbers uh, based on what we see in the industry. And I say relatively high, uh, I would maybe if there's a norm, it might be 20%. There are certainly uh, utilities with up into 50% variable rate debt but again, these are the gross amounts that don't represent the impact of various hedges and hedging tools that you have to offset that amount, some of that variable rate debt. Here we will we'll broadly or list some of the concerns and, and risk of variable rate debt. Obviously, there's the, the risk that the rates can, can go higher it's sharply or gradually. I would say normal in terms of variable rate debt interest rates for the last 20 years has been around 2% in the muni market. We also have structure risk and, and all of your variable rate generally requires a bank for either a lending capacity or lending credit to assure investors that they'll have liquidity if they want their money back out of the variable rate debt. And you also need investors. So you need those two partners, if you will, to keep those programs going. And then the other consideration is the opportunity cost of, or the fear of missing out of these very low interest rates. Right now, you could lock in sub 3% rates for, say, 20-year money. But to do that, you'd be foregoing sub 1% variable rates. And looking here is we get at the, the, the exposure that uh, JEA and its customers really have to, to variable rate debt. You can look at the gross amount of variable rate debt, as we've talked about for the different systems, 581 million for electric, 253 for water and sewer. A substantial portion of that debt is, is hedged very effectively with interest rate swaps, where you would pay a fixed rate on the swap and receive a periodic payment on the swap that's designed to offset uh, the actual variable rate. So they are a, a net fixed rate with those interest rate swaps. And, so the remaining unhedged, unswapped portion of the two systems is 178 and 158 million, respectively. The next thing we look at is the ability of your invested assets to hedge the risk of rising interest rates. You have, as you saw earlier on uh, in Joe's report, very roughly 700 million of invested assets on the electric side. About I think we used a number of 240. You know we were conservative and rounded down when we looked at a lot of those different uh, funds and accounts. And then what we then say is, these are the invested assets in those systems. We'll assume that roughly half of them are invested in relatively short fixed income securities, maturities of maybe less than a year, and that to the extent there was an increase in interest rates that would affect the variable rate debt cost, it would also affect the interest income on these portfolios whereby the increased earnings would offset the, the variable rate debt increase. So you see that on the electric side, 
at 350 million of the invested assets available to hedge, 178 million actually puts you in a negative exposure, if you will, to changes in interest rates on the electric side. And you're pretty much back close to even with a net exposure of 38 million on the water sewer side. Mike, this seems like we've got this thing well in hand. What can go wrong with this? I, I think if uh, you spin forward, and, and we'll, why don't I touch very briefly on this on this next page? And on this page here, we we put the the amount of variable rate debt in perspective and, and kind of compare the exposure on the interest rate side and the interest cost side to the entire annual revenue requirement. So we again look at the unhedged portion, the swap portion, and then what about after uh, the impact of the invested assets and say, what if rates go up 1%? What's the impact on the, on the rate payer? And if you look down at that bottom line, what it shows is a 1% increase in interest rates, this is what the, it would do to the percentage revenue requirement. So if interest rates go from 1% to 2%, actually on the electric side, you'd have more revenue than you would have cost. On the water side, you'd have very limited amount of cost uh, in, re in, uh, in relation to the, the revenue you would get in. So you're, in a sense, immunized from an interest rate perspective uh, in those two systems. And I think if we then take a look at some of the, the other risks associated with these programs, we can address uh, Director Stein's question. No, no but one, one of the issues, and I'm brainstorming here, is you got a tremendous capital budget going forward, you're in a capital intensive business, and if you get shut out of the capital markets, that could be, right. I, I think you can't look at it just in this. That's right, there's several other risks that, that we've got to take into account, and um, the bigger problem is future borrowing. This says we're in good shape. It's a good story with where we sit yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. Um, and so we don't, I think what this does is allows us to take the variable and the rest of the presentation will support this. We'll take the variable rate risk is not as, not a problem. Yeah. The future and how to the what we talked about earlier is the issue that I think is longer term. And Mike, I may be I mean Mike, maybe skipping yeah. ahead there, but that's the how do we borrow the right things at the right time um, going forward, which is the same yeah, thing. Yeah, that, that that's yeah. I mean, can you get in the markets and protect yourself today to do the capital projects you need for the future? Does that make sense, John? Yeah. And 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 obviously what our, our depreciation is is relevant too. Yeah. Mike, if I could address uh, Chair Baker's prior question about the cash balances. To, to be clear, the balance sh I showed earlier of approximately $540 million doesn't include St. John's River Power Park. There's another $150 million or so of cash, much of which we can use to pay down outstanding debt at Power Park when the remediation is complete. But I just wanted to address that apparent discrepancy in the cash balance. Joe, well, and, oh. and it's, as you may recall, we were looking, um, gosh, a year ago, I think, at our first finance and audit committee um, is, do we have the right mix? And I, I think for today, we, we do. I think this, this validates that. I think, Bobby, your point is well taken. We've got to do a lot of work around, you know, when those capital projects are going to come online, because you really, you don't want to go out and borrow until you've got an asset um that you're building so i think we've got a timing issue go forward for sure well, I, I, i'd say enough two things joe when is the remediation i thought it's going to be completed by the end of this past year it's been delayed and okay. now i believe they're looking at hopefully the second by the end of june or early july it, it's been delayed by the uh contract working on the project it has not increased the cost. It's just the contractor has has de delayed performance. Yeah, but but Marty, I mean, and I'm again brainstorming here is if you've got, you know, let's say somewhere between a billion and two billion dollars worth of projects that you know you're going to do, 
and you, you have the ability to get in the markets. And this, I think, is what you're saying, Jay, is you know, when do you take advantage of that? Not, you know, I'm sure that's something you're thinking about. It is. It's actually, and, and at the last board meeting, it's what we talked about when the idea of when the right time to borrow is. And but, I think, but you've you got know, assets you can borrow against today. Yes, as to, long as, yeah, that's right. And, and to take advantage of these. Yes. Because you, you get involved in these capital projects and you get stopped. It's, it's not something you want to be involved in. And that's, yes. it just goes back to, you know, I lived through the late seventies and early eighties and I, I just remember those days. So that's, that's just my conservative thought process. And as you note, that uh, the variable rate interest rate risk is but one component of the overall portfolio. The money that you borrow in the future for new capital, you also have refunding candidates as bonds will become callable. And a, a true analysis of interest rate risk would incorporate those elements as well. Yeah, but the, the, the last point I'm making is a lot of business, you can stop capital spend if you can't get in the markets. And cash flows don't meet those needs in this business. You can't get, you're, you, you can't stop these projects, or you shouldn't stop these projects to keep your. Well, that's a question. So it's a complicated answer that depends on um, if if the scenario that you describe happens, then what does that do to growth, and what do we have to do for, for future capital? So that's why we have to be careful to borrow appropriately for projects that are going to go forward regardless. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That, that's, that, that's, that's the balance that we do. But I think, I, I think we all actually agree that borrowing at the right time for the right stuff is good. And that our past practice, Joe, I may overstate this, but I think you'll get the point. The past Patrick has been pay off debt. And now how much new money have you issued in the last several years, Joe? We have not issued new money uh, since 2012. And we need to. That's, that's that's need the, to. I think we said that at the board at the board meeting last time, and we just have to figure out the right time and write them out. Yeah. Uh, so I think we're all on the same page. That that Yeah. That that's where I'm focused, Marty, yep. and and I appreciate this is very helpful. But I, I'm I just we, we our goal was just to to put aside the conversation <coughs> about mix on um on variable and fixed and. Again, I think this has been a great presentation to help us agree on that. I think we will know more in the coming months about our capital spend and the timing thereof. And I, in, and I think we'll be issuing new debt. But Have I right. lost you again? No, no, no but, uh, but John, you're right, it's, it's got to have. Yeah, that's, I mean, the, that's, things, enough, that's the number we need to focus on, right? I just lived through, and Bobby, so did you, lived through a time when we were had an awful lot of debt, and we never seemed to be paying any debt down. So I just think we need to balance um, the right levels of debt for the right projects. And I, I know Jay and his, his team are, are going to be presenting um, a, a plan for what that looks like. This will be, this will be fun to see Mike get this back into the presentation in the right spot. <laughs> well, I'll turn now to a little discussion about the, the structure risks that we just uh, touched on before. And as I noted, that in variable rate debt, you generally need two partners. You need banks for credit, and you need buyers to be there. And the banks have to provide letters and lines of credit or be a direct lender. Those letters and lines of credit cost money, anywhere from a, of a quarter percent to three quarters of a percent. And the price and availability generally depends on how strong banks are as a group at any point in time. Fortunately, now the banks have pretty well recovered. We have a list of the currently active banks here, that top line of banks and maybe a couple on the next line are each capable of providing at least 300 million in credit to a double A, a large double A type utility. Some of the others well over 100 million. And then when you get down into the regional banks, it could be more like 50 million. So there's a couple billion dollars worth of capacity generally out there. 
for a, a good double A credit. But certainly during the peak of, of COVID and the credit crisis, the new capacity was limited and the prices jumped up to about twice what they were. But there are, there are ways to manage that bank credit risk, the first and foremost of which is to maintain your own credit strength to be an attractive counterparty. Also to maintain reserve capacity. You never want to be all bumping up against the total amount of bank capacity that you could ever get. And you want to use the competition of the market when it's appropriate. And you want to use historical relationships at times to, to maximize the availability and price of, of bank capacity. You also diversify your bank portfolio with the name, the expiration terms and timing, and you have different open market and public market options. The other partner you need are the investors. The, the market for short-term tax exempt debt is vast, but primarily it's the money market funds. Those funds generally are about 150 billion in total, but during some disruptions, when those funds start to see withdrawals, then that, that limits that market of investors, and that's why you see those spikes. So those structure events that we describe, they fortunately have been rare, and they're the bookends of what are those tranquil and, and good times in the market. But anybody who's been through them will never forget uh, those times when it can be hard to place variable rate debt. And, and lastly, it's what I referred to as the fear of missing out on what is a very good long-term fixed rate market. Here we describe the fact that uh, at least uh, a couple of days ago, we put this together, the 20-year triple or double-A muni bond index was 1.79%. For the most part, you're selling callable bonds that have 5% coupons. So you plan to call those bonds and, and you essentially have to refund that bond again at 1.79 to really make that a full 20 year of a 1.79% rate. At this point, you could fix out all the unhedged variable rate debt at a cost of roughly 2% all in. And that's compared to a cost of roughly a half a percent, maybe a little bit more all in currently. And if you look at what the impact of that would be on the electric and the water and sewer systems respectively, you would see if you fixed out all that debt, it would increase debt service about $800,000 dollars on the electric side and about 1.5 million on the water sewer. And then we look at a peer comparison of other municipal utilities across the country. Uh, we have them listed. Apologize, I apologize for the small print, but I think if you go down to the bottom two rows, it really tells the story. The next the last row is their everybody's net variable rate debt as a percent of the total amount of debt they have. So you can see the industry as a whole has limited amount of net variable rate debt. And then we look at that metric of what if interest rates went up 1%, what would it mean in terms of the rate increase they might have to have just to offset that increase? And you see, again, all very low numbers, very little exposure as an industry to variable rate debt and JEA fits pretty much right in, in the pack, certainly on this uh, that net exposure at the bottom. And in summary, the JEA's use of variable rate debt has saved a lot of money, just a, a ballpark. Looking at historical rates and the performance of the program, it's about $150 million for rate payers over 20 years. At, in the current situation, you don't have much exposure to variable rate debt for, in, for variable rate interest rate increases. Again, that's on the variable rate debt program, which is but one component of the overall capital structure. And your risk is very consistent with, with industry norms. And, but long-term rates, as we've talked about, are extraordinarily low, even though they have jumped up pretty substantially in the past few months. So if, even if you do uh, convert to variable rate debt or to convert to fixed, there would be a cost associated with that in the current market. So Mike, what is your guidance on rates go forward? Um, I mean, I, I know my financial industry um, analysis, uh, the, the banks don't anticipate 
rates moving dramatically anytime soon? I mean, I'm thinking three to five years. Or what? What is PFM saying? Well, certainly on the short-term rate, the Fed has has uh, proclaimed loudly it plans to keep rates low for an extended period of time. But on the long-term side, with the amount of stimulus dollars that are coming into the market and the potential for a pretty broad opening of the economy, it, it's hard to imagine that long-term fixed rates don't go up if those things happen. Even looking out over the last six months, you've seen the 30-year U.S. Treasury bond go from around 1.2%, 1.3% up to almost 2.4% today. And that's been a, primarily a steady progression in anticipation of the economy, in anticipation of dollars coming into it. And I, I don't see that, uh, that changing or reversing itself. You know, uh, I think to get to a more normalized U.S. Treasury rate environment, of still going up 50 to 100 basis points wouldn't be unreasonable to anybody to see that. The short side, Fed can be very powerful and keep those rates down. I'm taking the other side of that bet. <laughs> I think we're going to have massive inflation, and I think rates are going to move in the next two years. And we're going to make good decisions. Right way. down the middle. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Did you find this helpful? This was great, yes. Marty. Thank you. Good. Thank you. All right. Good job, uh, Mike. Thank you for joining us. And um, we will move into the energy market risk management policy. Ricky. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll go over this fairly quickly. It's, it's all in your package. Uh, Julie, Julie and Joe have talked about the, the fuel issue. They've already addressed that, so we're pretty good on the fuel fund. And everything else is in the green. So for our quarterly report, we're all looking pretty good this month. We do have some minor uh, administrative changes to discuss. Uh, they're all outlined right here on the slide, and we're looking for approval for this to update our energy market risk management policy. Are there any questions on any of these changes? There are only action items that we need. Yeah, no, this is an action item. I want to make sure that um, Bobby and John have had time to, to digest them and understand what, what, what's being asked. They are, um, they're just little tweaks. There are administrative thing. changes to clean up the, um, the policy. And it looks like, I, I think Bobby stepped away, but um, when we're comfortable, we would, would I'd entertain a motion to accept um, the revisions to policy. Um, question. If we'd had the Texas experience, have we tested our policy against the Texas experience and Uh, we're looking at it now. Uh, a lot of the Texas experience, they, they lost a lot of natural gas for a lot of their plants, uh, and a lot of the plants tripped. Uh, for, so for fuel, they did impact us over that particular week here. We had some um, some issues with getting some natural gas, which we were able to convert our diesel fuel and some of our oil at Northside to counteract that. So we are looking at that. But, um, we haven't got a full full answer on that. We're going to be part of Jay's resiliency team and address those type of concerns moving forward. And we have scheduled on the board meeting an update on the impact that it had on us directly. Um, and as we move forward, these changes were more the administrative changes under typical. And as we move forward through resiliency and through the study of what the cold weather might mean to us, then I think that's something we have to take into account and be sure we're in the right place. I have I have no issues. Um, then I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you very much.
Thank, Thank you. you Rick. Can I ask a question, Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Of course. On, on page nine of the policy, it says very top, it says JEA's maximum counterparty credit limit for energy transactions is a hundred million. Um, does that include PPAs? And wouldn't they be more than that? Ricky, I don't know the answer to that. I don't either, but it does include PPAs. The, the Vogel thing might be a little different in that, um, but that's really for like day-to-day, month-to-month uh, transactions. That's what it's intended to cover. There's a chart. We'll get that answer. Okay. Yeah, we should get that answer. All right, great. Thank you. Um, in our agenda, this is the time where we excuse our staff and um, we, we are still operating in the sunshine, um, but we get an opportunity to talk to audit without staff um, present. So, Landon, I'm going to ask you to, to disconnect staff. Marty, Marty, I'm sorry. Marty, I, before the staff leaves, I, I want to thank you, Marty, for what you've done and Joe stepping up in his role. Um, you guys have accomplished a lot. And I just want to thank the whole staff that what they've done, how they've stepped up. And Marty, for your leadership. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Staff is incredible. They really um, have done a great job answering all of our questions and getting us caught up. I think we're all excited about the future um, and not not constantly being re reeducated on on um, on policies, but to actually be looking into the future on the finance side is exciting. Thank you. All right. Well, th th we will ask staff to um, depart us. So, Landon, if we can disconnect staff from um, the virtual meeting, that would be great. I see Jay in motion. Um, and this is our time to.